So if you or someone you know has questions, let's talk. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Trent, I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, <coughs> I've known about your company and Unanimous and Pickering Creative yeah. and all of that. Um, and like we talked previously, I've um, had some um, projects with them. So yeah. I'm excited to learn about your company sure. and um, branding and how we can all utilize branding in our own um, companies and our own projects. So I'll give the floor to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, my hope is today to talk a little bit. I'll, I'll introduce myself, just a little information there. Uh, I'll introduce my company, tell you a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about some things to be thinking about on branding. And then I've left a lot of time to just answer questions that anybody might have. That, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. So um, I, have, I have slides with me. So you can kind of focus your attention here. This is a little bit of information about me. Um, I've been at Unanimous for uh, 16 years now. Um, I'm one of three owners of that company. Um, the bullets underneath that are all the different roles that I've had within the organization. Um, you know, uh, she mentioned Pickering Creative Group. Uh, my company rebranded from Pickering Creative Group back in 2014. And Pickering Creative Group was established in 1979. So the company's been around a long time. Transition to ownership in uh, 2016. And uh, like, like I said, I've had a lot of different roles. I started there in 2007 as a graphic designer. Um, I went to college at UNO. I have a, actually have a bachelor in fine arts. Um, which is a little unique for probably a um, person in my situation, but it's worked out. Um, and I have two other partners that have different backgrounds, and so it's very complimentary how that works. Uh, I went to high school at Southeast, so I've been in, in Lincoln for a long time. Um, before that, I was born and raised in Scotts Bluff in the western end of the state, uh, the Panhandle, Wyo, Nebraska, they call it out there, um, and moved here to start high school when I was 15. I'm married with children. Uh, my wife and I have two kids, ages 12 and 16. Um, and my interests are art, technology, movies, books, travel, I mean, just to name a few. I went ahead and put a picture of one of my recent trips this last um, summer. I got to take a trip to Iceland um, with, with a group of guys. And so this is, I'm actually the little blue dot right about there. So on this cliff. Um, in Iceland that I, that I did last year. So just, just something, uh, a fun thing to get out. Uh, when you're looking for inspiration, I've found that travel is one of the best ways, you know, new perspectives kind of aid in that. Uh, I have some more thoughts on this photo, but I'm going to share those later uh, as, that, as it has to do with kind of um, trying to grow and level up your business. So, um, so now a little bit about unanimous. So in Latin, unanimous means one mind. And when we were thinking about rebranding our business to be called Unanimous, this made a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons. Um, mostly because one of the things we're always trying to drive into people's head about branding is that you need to be consistent. So everything being unified and cohesive, one mind made a lot of sense. But the second part of that has to do with the fact that we feel like um, we come alongside your, your organization or we work with people without any sort of ego or you know overbearing attitudes. We want to we want to be partners with you. And so um, we just want to be an extension of your team so we all come together to be one mind as far as your brand goes too. So um, a few different things that kind of ab about our business, these are kind of what we would consider to be key messaging points about Unanimous. So we're experts. Everyone on our team has been doing what they've been doing for a long time. We're not going to put any interns or um, new people learning on the job situations necessarily that you're going to be working with on professional projects. That's not to say that we don't have an internship program. We, we hire interns and we, we think that's really important to foster um, you know, and develop new creatives and, and people in the, in the workforce and, and in the workplace. But the people that are working on actual projects for clients all have been doing this for a long time. I think we've done a few tallies where we would say we have about 150, 160 years of combined experience amongst the, we have 15 on our team now. And as of Monday, there'll be 16 of us, I think. So, and there's kind of a picture of everyone. Like I said, we'll be adding a new box to this slide. Um, big on connections, making that connection. Um, there's a number of agencies or branding agencies or marketing agencies, and when people work with them, they think 
uh, or they've had experiences where they come in and the, the agency will say, listen, we're going to tell you what to do, just, just follow this. We know that you know a lot about your business and we want to take that information and amplify it with, with our process. So we're pretty comprehensive. We do a lot of different things. So we have the, the marketing and advertising component, the creative component, the web component, and then video and storytelling component too. So this is kind of like a, a, a dump of all the different things and all the different ways we help organizations. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, we're specialized. We, it seems like there's a lot of different things going on in there, but believe it or not, um, we've kind of found that we have some core areas where we do a lot of work. Uh, healthcare, education, nonprofit, and construction tend to be our biggest groupings, but we've started to work with a lot of, um, a lot of banks. We've done a lot of government work. We do a lot of um, real estate stuff even. Um, manufacturing is another big component of, of where we help. Um, but we understand, as you and I were just talking about, we kind of, as we work with more and more schools, we understand all the different inventory that goes into their brand and the architecture and the hierarchy of, you need a, a school mascot, you need a foundation logo, you need an anniversary logo or seal, you know, different things like that. So we can speak to the needs that, that um, cross all the different stakeholders involved in those various areas. So. Um, impactful. We're big on results. We don't like to do anything that we can't measure. So if we're helping you with your brand, we're not trying to do something just because it's pretty or it looks nice. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we have some way to track the success. Are we getting conversions? Are we getting calls? Are we getting leads? Are we getting donations? You know, and each one of those um, interactions or strategies are going to be different based on who we're talking to and, and what they need. So. Um, and then alignment. Um, if I was to say in the shortest amount of time what we do or in the, in the most succinct way what Unanimous does, I would say we are experts in brand alignment. We're going to make sure that everything that you have to do with your brand is aligned and works together and is coordinated um, across the board. So we use this process and it starts with discovery. It's the whole adage of, of sharpening the axe before you cut down the tree is as much, if not bigger part of the process than anything else. Um, you know, the verbal components of your brand, the visual components, the tactics, and then just making sure you're viewing to see what's working and what's not. So, you know, in discovery, we use a, we use a, a brief, a project brief, where we want to get to really know you when we meet you and understand what makes your business different from anybody else, but we also want to understand personality. We also want to understand strengths, weaknesses. It's, it's a little bit of strategic planning that goes into this. Um, we have this workbook. It's not like we hand it off and say, hey, fill this out and come back to us when you know all the answers. We want to sit down and kind of do that together so that um, we can have some dialogue. A lot of times the information that's in the book is good. But the dialogue and the conversation we have about it is even better. Help us understand why you feel that way, how you got there in the first place, a lot of different things that go along with that. So the discovery is key and important to like onboarding that relationship. Developing that trust, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Making sure that you know that we have your best interests in mind, but also know where you're coming from and where you want to go, right? Um, you know, verbal identity, this, this is really important. A lot of people overlook this part. Um, you know, this includes a lot of different things as far as your, your, your foundational elements, like your core values, your mission, you know, um, your elevator pitch, any of your brochure elements, your website content, you know, any of that, that content that is expressed verbally you know, written or, or vocally. Um, but what you need to ask yourself is, you know, what are people saying about my, my organization? Is it what I want them to say? Is it accurate? And again, is it consistent? Then the visual side of things is very similar. I think the most important thing to think about when you're thinking about your brand as far as visuals go is does, does the quality of what I'm putting out there represent the quality of service or product that I provide? You know, I, I don't know how many times we've dealt with people that have come in our doors looking for help and they say, you know, I, I don't want to send anybody to my website. I don't want to give anybody my logo because it doesn't represent 
the, the type of work I'm doing. It doesn't, it doesn't match the quality, you know? And so that's where we can help hone that a little bit too. Again, you know, do you look outdated or forward thinking? Is that important in your area? A lot of, um, a lot of educational institutions, a lot of, um, you know, tech companies, like they need to look cutting edge. And if they look like their logo was done in the 80s or their website looks like it was, you know, out of date, it's not going to play well for them probably. It's your first impression. And I'm sure that that has changed and progressed as how customers seek out businesses has changed. Long gone are the, I shouldn't say long gone, but most people don't pick up the phone and call. Mm -hmm. They go to your website first, right? Yep. A website is going to be most often your probably first impression. So, yeah. <laughs> the Google search has taken over the Yellow Pages long ago, yes. you know? So, if anybody even knows what the Yellow Pages is anymore, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah you yellow got them. <laughs> pages a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, well, there's one right in the recycling bin. Yep. yep. Our kids didn't even know what they were. <laughs> there there's telephone article. books. Yeah. There was an article in the paper, I think, right after this came out that it was their last issue of Yellow. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. It made great door stops. And, and, so, and I think I've been told that even like, I want to say like even five years ago, I think it was illegal for them to distribute it in places like California because it was such a waste of paper that you, you had to specifically request it or they couldn't even drop it off. So, yeah. But going to that, though, I was trying to look up something Googling it the other day. Yeah. And I couldn't find it because it was so yeah. convoluted and everything. I mm. ended up going. To, yeah. Did you? Because it's like, okay, where do I find it? And it's like, okay, it was like their website was so convoluted, mm -hmm. you could not click on something <laughs> and just find the answer right away. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there has to be everything has to be intuitive on how to find your business, and you you need to make sure that you're you're available and that it's effortless for your audience to find you and figure out how to how to get in touch with you or get the information they need for sure. So, tactics, um, you know, are you are you regular? Are you relevant and strategic with your communication? Uh, are you top of mind when people think of a business or a service that they need? Are you going to be the person that they call or reach out to? That's important. It needs to be accessible, effortless, just like, like we were talking about before. So, and again, you might notice this is getting a little bit um, redundant, but are you consistent? Um, and then the review side of things. You know, again, I mentioned we don't like to do anything that you can't track. So, uh, we recommend looking at your analytics. You know, a lot of times, uh, websites are a good way to track metrics. You know, we, they have analytics and you can graph and chart how often people come, how long they spend, how much time they spend on your site, you know, where did they come from, what, what words did they search to find you. You know, there's just this wealth of information that can, can be kind of scary to people when they see how much information is out there. And I'm sure we've all heard about it on the news and things like that, that you know, what's, what's being tracked and what can and can't be and things like that. So we want to make sure that we can leverage whatever we can. Knowledge is power. And we want to leverage whatever we can to help you grow uh, your brand. So. so in that situation, Trent, mm -hmm. let's say you ha you're working with a business who is new to data analysis. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about, I mean, do you recommend programs for them or how do you get them on board with the importance of looking at their data? Sure. Yeah, so we try to schedule regular meetings where we sit down and we kind of boil it down to what we think are the highest priority uh, metrics you should be looking at, you know, and whether that has to do with your website or a mailing campaign or a direct mail like postcard campaign or or anything, we're going to look at, you know, what are, again assess what goals you have in mind and then see what metrics point to those. You know, is it, uh, for example, at a college or university, they may covet the um, people signing up for a campus tour, yes. right? And so we're going to look at how many times people filled out a form online and how many times that then led to an actual tour, you know, and being able to kind of say, all right, here's where they came through the website to get to this. You know, how many clicks did it take them to get to this? You know, was it one? Was it easy? Um, and then you need to measure it from, from when you started. You know, you need to have a baseline. How was it before we started, you know, marketing anything or sending out mailers? And then look for increases, you know, over time. So we recommend looking at those at a minimum of quarterly, okay. but we also send out kind of what we call 
um, a stylized, simplified report on a weekly basis. You can give those reports as often as daily if you want to, but it can get a little bit mind-numbing, you know? And, and you don't get to see, you, you see incremental growth. It's kind of like you have, you've had a puppy or a child, and if you're around them every day, you don't really notice the growth as much, but if you haven't seen them for a while, and you come back, you're like, whoa, there's some difference here, right? So being able to kind of take some time away and then inspect the, the comparison between this and that can be really impressive over time, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is just a phrase about branding. Again, you can go around telling everybody what you are and who you are and what your brand's like, but it's really not about what you say, it's about what they say. Um, which is just to say, it's, it's really the essence of your organization. Um, another uh, interesting thing I like to talk about when it comes to brand is, brand is really kind of what is the personality of your organization? What sort of experiences are you providing for people? And are you doing it consistently? Again, right? So that's what's going to basically build your brand essentially over time. And then the last thing that I have on this is branding equals trust, trust equals engagement, and engagement builds community. So a lot of what people are doing, whether they realize it or not, or what they want to do is build a community of people that trust them as their number one source for a service or a product. That's a community. So a lot of people don't look at it like that. It's just a kind of a new perspective to think about. Um, and if you have community, then all those people are talking and kind of cheering you on together, and you're all working together kind of towards common goals. So um, one thing that I want to talk about, I think, is one of the more important things when it comes to just starting or found, building a foundation for your brand has to do with just values, core values. So a lot of times people will say, I, I mean, I, can't mean it. I can tell you that the most used value that I've ever heard is integrity over time and honesty. Those are really common values for a lot of different organizations and businesses. Um, the problem with those is, in my mind, is that those are cost of entry values. And what I mean by that is like, you wouldn't work with someone who wasn't honest or didn't have integrity. So let's think a little bit outside the box and, and figure out what makes you different than everybody else. So the other important thing about values is that this is how you're going to grow your company and find like-minded people to work with you, especially when you get to the point where you're going beyond just yourself as far as um, a business goes. So being able to hire and fire and evaluate people based on those values is, is pinnacle. It's the most important thing you can do to kind of create alignment. That way, you're setting yourself up and your, and your team to live your brand, right? So these are the core values at Unanimous. We've got um, you know, the positivity, the expertise, tenacity, and unity. And so uh, once a year, we, each person on our team gets evaluated on those things. And we've got five different criteria that go along with each one of these, and you can see a score. And so that's how we keep ourselves in, in check, if you will, to make sure that it's a good fit for someone and we don't have someone that's always negative Nancy or a naysayer on everything that's going on or um, it also encourages us to continue uh, education too on the expertise side so are we are we still out there learning I mean what we do changes really fast so making sure that we're we're staying ahead of the curve and or at least keeping up you know um, with all that is really important too so we just read a book in book club that was um, permission to screw up. Mm -hmm. And so it's a story about um, a young entrepreneur who started a cleaning business. And she had these core values, or their leadership team developed these core values, but they didn't adhere to them. Mm -hmm. And so then it, it, that's one of her mistakes. And she talks about that. And, um, you know, she was more of a, I don't like to, I like to be kind of loosey goosey with this. and. Um, another one of her colleagues really liked to stick to those core values and she really came to the conclusion that if they weren't about their core values then really what were they about so yeah it was it was interesting to see how she came to that because it wasn't just natural sure yeah when it comes to core values some people say well how can I how do I decide on what they should be or how do I figure those out um, it can be, if you have a team already, a decent sized team, you can think about which people do I, um, 
admire the most on my team or who brings the most value to my team and what qualities do they have? And you can kind of start a list there. Um, you know, and even for smaller teams, you can think about what qualities have brought me success. You know, how have I, how have I reached the, um, the success that I've, I've been after? You know, we always tell people somewhere between three and five, I've seen companies that have like eight or 10 values and you're like, there's no way anybody's ever gonna remember all of these things, right? A lot of times we'll try to create acronyms for people too so that they can, that trickles down and, and especially with really big teams like hospitals and things like that, that's been really helpful. Um, so yeah, I just think it's, it's really important for a baseline for everything moving forward. So um, again, alignment helps with all that alignment. So. Um, Let's see, I think I only have, oops, I'm going the wrong way again. So I told you I'd come back to this picture again. Um, and I was thinking about this when I put this in the slide deck a little bit, about, you know, there's only so many ways you can get to the top of this cliff. And this is by no means a Mount Everest, or am I saying that, like, I've reached the, the top of the cliff. But I started thinking about the different ways to kind of achieve business success. Um, you know, you can hike to the top of this cliff. On the far back corner of this, you can see a, a lighthouse, and there's some steam behind there. That's where we started our hike to get to where we're at, way back there. It was like a five or six mile hike to get up there. So that requires stamina. There's lots of ups and downs. There's a few different things you run into, obstacles on the way there. It, it, it can wear you out. You're gonna need resilience, and it's gonna take time. Um, you could fly up there with a helicopter. You could have a helicopter drop you off there, but that's going to cost money, and you're going to probably have to have some relationships uh, built to, to get there, too. Um, you can climb, but that's going to require some talent, um, some strength, for sure, and it's also going to uh, have some risk involved in that, in that. And then the last thing is you could maybe teleport there, but you know, you're going to have to invent a teleporter and use some creativity. Um, but there's going to be some innovation, and there's also going to probably be some luck for you to stumble across or have those ideas um, to get you to get you to that spot where you want to be and, and be able to kind of enjoy yourself up there. So, I you know this was like I said I didn't take a ton of time putting this part together, but it was just I thought it was kind of interesting and played back into the initial um, picture again. I think is. Is there just one way to get up there? I don't think so. A lot of times I think it's a lot of different combinations of these things that will help you build success over time. But those, as I kind of sat down and thought about it, were all the different um, components that I've harnessed to kind of build a business, I guess. Me, me and my partners and my team, I should say. It's definitely not a one-person situation, so. Well, I'm sure that's with the, the way with your customers, too. They don't. Not every single customer comes to their core values or um, a brand mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -mm. Um, you're going to have a lot of different um, preconceived notions going into those meetings, and um, everybody gets to it differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's not uncommon when someone comes in to us and says, I need a new website. And we start talking about what does the website need to do or you know, how do you want it to look? And what we find out is that they need to start maybe with kind of a new logo or they need to get their verbal identity in place. I mean, they're like, I don't know, no one's really ever asked me. And, and we talk about, again, the consistency and creating that professional um, trust you know, with, with their audience, so yeah. I think that's the last, I, the only other slide I think on here is just, yeah, questions. So that's, thanks for letting me go through that. Um, you talked um, initially that um, you like to read mm -hmm. your books. Mm -hmm. So we like to ask our guest speakers um, sure. what book recommendations you have, either sure. personally or business oriented that sure. um, have helped you or that you keep going back to. Sure. Well, if I, I think in the entrepreneur state, um, with the values part of it, you know, we've kind of borrowed some ideas as we help people build values from the book tra Traction. Um, so I think that's always a good one. I mean, what it does is it kind of sets up a cadence for you to check yourself, and set those goals, um, and, and stay on track for those types of things. You know, it holds you accountable, and I think, especially when you're starting out, that can be really important. It's just like with anything, if you're gonna work out, and you're doing that on your own, that can be a lot harder than if you have a coach or someone that's holding you accountable to do those things, right? 
Um, traction kind of sets a framework for some of that. Uh, and we took a lot of what we, we apply a lot of the value part of traction to kind of our onboarding process. Um, so I think that one's really good. Um, one of my favorite books that I've read in the last year or so was <laughs> Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. Um, it was just really entertaining. Um, Matthew McConaughey has a book called Green Lights. That, that's, it's really entertaining, but it also has like a lot of little like life lessons that he's learned along the way um, that I thought were, were really interesting. Um, you know, there's probably a couple books that are pretty uh, commonly referred to, but good to great. Um, Jim Collins and um, Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey is a really good one too. Um, just for framework for like growth and um, uh, kind of uh, nurturing a team, I would say. So I listened to Green Lights through an audiobook and Matthew McConaughey read it. Yeah. And I was really glad that I and I love to read. Yeah. Um, I was glad that I picked that as an audiobook because I, I he did it, it was perfect. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I listen to a lot of books, too, because I can do, I actually absorb the information um, better that way. I can do mow the lawn or fold laundry or do other things. And I feel like I'm, I'm not just, I feel like I'm getting more accomplished. And I also tend to soak it in a little bit better. There is an app, if you like audio books and you like audio things like that, there's an app called Blinkist, um, if you're not familiar with that. And it's like cliff notes of books in audio format. And it's, I mean, you can, you can absorb a lot of information. It's like the highlights, and, and it's a great, they have a free one, and then they have a paid subscription, just like everything else. But they have free books that um, they kick out every once in a while. It's kind of almost like listening to podcasts because they're short little snippets. They also have the notes on in the app, too, so you can read them if you want to read them. Um, it's a really ex excellent app, too. So. Yeah, we're big. Our team is big on Blinkist. We yeah. even couple um, book clubs ago, we decided to do something different. And we did a Blinkist book club. Yeah. Um, and it was on emotional intelligence. So um, I'm a big advocate for that. I yeah. listen to a lot of different books that I wouldn't have listened to before. Sure. So, um, There's another one out there too called Libby. Uh, Libby? <laughs> you, you can not work that with your local friend put me onto that as an old guy. <laughs> yeah. Put that up to in the library and download a lot. Of, you just check it out for your use. Yeah. Take you a week or two weeks, you can get it. And I've been using that to pull my books too. Yeah, that's great. Does anybody have any questions for Trent? Uh, there's many hats an entrepreneur must wear: supply chain management, finance, uh, marketing, etc. But there is a facet of business etiquette that you like or dislike, you'd like to emphasize? Hmm. Business etiquette. That's a good question. I think it's, you know, there's lots of different types of businesses out there. And you have to kind of understand what makes sense for your market or industry. Um, what I've understood, or what I've come to understand, I should say, is that it's always good to kind of match the, the situation you're walking into. So for example, if I'm going to meet with hospital executives, I think I want to dress like the hospital, the hospital executives are going to dress. Um, I want to talk their language. I want to speak their language. And you're going to connect with them better if you're in tune with their culture and, and the way that they interact. And so etiquette is kind of a moving target, I think, depending on who you're talking to a lot of times. But I always think. Um, Politeness is key, um, courtesy, follow-up is huge. It's something that is like missing in this day and age from a lot, a lot of different interactions that we're having, which just shocks me because it's so easy to follow up, um, even through email or this and that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that would be my answer to that question. And I think it's interesting to have older kids, so I have a sophomore in college and a senior in high school, to teach them that etiquette. Mm -hmm. Like our daughter has, today, has an interview for an internship. And so I was going through the steps she needed to, you know, I was like, what are you going to wear? Mm -hmm. um, those things. And, um, I, and she's like, well, what should I take to the interview? I was like, well, your resume. 
and I said, make sure you have questions. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think she had thought about that. Right. She said, you need to go look at their website. You need to go through these things. And I mean, she's a sophomore in college. She's an accounting major. Mm -hmm. And um, those are just things that maybe they just haven't done. I mean, she's had job interviews. Yeah. But this is that next step up for her. So, yeah, um, yeah it, I think it's, and I, being authentic and um, having a little bit of grace with mm -hmm. the different um, groups that we work with that um, everybody's coming at a different place. Yeah, if you want to stand out in this day and age, uh, send a thank you email. That's that's one good. But if you want to step up from that, send a send a written thank you. I mean, that's like we we'll ring a bell in our office when we get one of those from an applicant. I mean, it's that's how rare it is. You know, it's just. <laughs> I mean, people appreciate that, and it's, again, you want to be top of mind, you want to stand out, you want to create this personal brand for yourself that they recognize, that's, that's a difference maker, yeah. so. Absolutely. Trent, when you started, you talked about alignment. Mm -hmm. and that very, one of those very first slides you had, yeah. you were showing what it looked like, mm -hmm. subtraction type forms. Mm -hmm. You use that quite a bit with clients in terms of helping them have a process in place to track there? Or is there something else you use along with that to, I mean, it's something they got to own. Yep. That. Mm -hmm. What do you have that helps? Yeah, so we do, yeah, we'll, I mean, part of that happens when we go through the, that kickoff or that jumpstart um, document where we, we um, meet with them and kind of do an assessment, right, of, yeah. of what pieces do you have you know, what state are they in? Are they in a good state, a bad state, you know, non-existent? And then, um, you know, where, where are their holes in your, in your plan? So trying to be able to look at all the different pieces or, you know, a lot of times we'll just, one of the first steps is bring us everything you've done so far and let's lay it out and see how well it, it, it matches. You know, does this look like that? If I, if I got this business card and I went to that website, would there be a disconnect? Would I be, or would I know, oh yeah, I'm in the right spot immediately, you know? So, uh, checklists, I guess to answer your question, there's, there's a series of checklists and also just kind of assessments that you go through to check and say, are we doing this right? I mean, not to mention just the value-based <laughs> the value -based side of things, right? Does, does all this align with, with what we say we are and who we are and why we're different? But uh, it's, it's a pretty long list depending on which area needs focus, right? So yeah, yeah. So are you familiar with Lori and AJ Gaming at Brand Builders? I don't think I've heard of that group before. Okay. They talk about building relationships, building your brand. Mm -hmm. um, I think you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Recently, within the last couple of months, AJ interviewed, and I cannot remember her name, but she was talking about in your logos and whatnot, she does like almost like a color scheme that, okay, this color represents mm -hmm. the value that you have, this color represents. Yeah. So yeah, I just found it really fascinating that we look at a card mm -hmm. and it's telling us something, mm -hmm. even if we're not aware of it. Yeah. So this color represents strength, this color creativity. Mm -hmm. and it's coming in, again, that we're not even aware of that, okay, well, trust or... Sure. So. Yeah, we um, color is a big color. Uh, psychology is huge part of um, branding, and when it comes to the visual identity side of things, I mean, for example, uh, probably one of the most common things that we talk about is um, when it comes to color and feelings is when in healthcare or dental, we try to avoid red because it's alarming or pain or blood or lots of different things there. I mean, dentists, we try to avoid like green or brown or dingy colors, you know, like things like that, you know, that maybe aren't necessarily feelings, but things that come top of mind when you're talking to people. So, um, you know, and it's interesting too, to think strategically, sometimes you're just looking for a different color to disrupt what, what's there, right? We're in, we're in a town where everybody's logo is red, you know, right? So how do I stand out? You know, maybe I do a purple or something like that, that, that so I can be seen or noticed easier than, than just kind of, and, and it all has to do with your goals. Do you want to stand out? Do you want to fit in? You know, where, where does it make sense? And sometimes people want to fit in. You know, one, there's a, there's a strategy that has to do with um, a marketing strategy called judo marketing. 
And that has to do with using the bigger guy's weight against them, right? If I don't, I don't know a ton about judo, but I know that it's about like weight manipulation or kind of being able to, to take on someone bigger than you are because you're using their weight. So your to your advantage, right? So a lot of times what people, what that means is, or how, do, how does that translate to marketing is that you can kind of let the bigger people in your space do all the research and find out, you know, what's going on. And you can, you can copy that to some degree, right? You can leverage, you know, where are they advertising? What kind of advertising are they using? Are, as long as the audience is the same, you can kind of leverage that and then hone in on it and make it work for you. So it's good to know your competition. Oh, I mean, that's absolutely key. Um, that's one of the first things we want to want to know when we're onboarding too. Is, you know, who are you up against? What do they do? What do they claim to do best? You know, and how are you different? Just being able to distinguish, create that um, unique selling proposition or USP, some people call it, um, differentiation, other people call it. But you need to know what you're up against because one, you don't. If you don't know what's out there, you don't know if you're looking too much like someone else or if you're standing out. Um, but again, you need to know what's missing in the market. What are people asking for they're not getting from the people that already exist? I think people, it's easy to overlook, you know, like you know your competition is out there, but to really know what your competition is doing, mm -hmm. I think is imperative, especially in the entrepreneurship world. Mm -hmm. um, because if your competition is getting into a new tech area, mm -hmm. um, maybe you want to go in there, but maybe you don't, too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but it's always good to know what they're up to. Yep. Yeah, research is really important. Um, competitive research, but also just um, your target market research. You know, we spend a lot of time with different organizations just sitting down and doing focus groups with, you know, whether they're new clients, their oldest clients, people that don't use them anymore. You know, when, when we're sitting down doing research, we're not looking for everyone to tell us how awesome we are. You know, we're trying to get some critical, constructive information to improve or make changes based on that information. You know, the no stone unturned approach is really going to set you up for the, the greatest success, knowing what people really want instead of what you think they want. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. well, along that line, it's nice to be able to develop relationships with those other companies because maybe they only deal with large companies. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. Trent, mm -hmm. you might contact Trent because he's more like for, you know, we can't get to it right now for, and then you in the same way, refer to them, okay, we're not set up to do that, but you. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's right size is, is a big thing too, you know. Um, another question that we like to ask guest speakers is, um, what are some of your favorite local businesses to um, patron? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Yaya's Pizza. Um, we we yeah. spent a lot of time there. Um, you know, my son, I spent a lot of time at the soccer facility out at Speedway um, Fields. My son is playing soccer, so I'm there like three or four times a week, I feel like. Um, those are big, big spots for us. Um, I don't know, what else? Um, I don't know. I'm also dangerously, I live dangerously close to Menard, so I spend a lot of time um, there as well. The south side, okay. south side. So you might see me there often. I feel like my honey-do list is very long and <laughs> I have a lot of projects to accomplish. So, so yeah, I would say those are, are probably my most common spaces. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a favorite of mine also. I used to work downtown and it was yeah. nice to just be able to go across the street and. Mm -hmm. Grab a slice of pizza and mm -hmm. go back to work. Yep, for sure. Yaya's, Laszlo's, Momo's are pretty common places for us to end up. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions? John? Of course. I've known Trent 15, 16 years now. Mm -hmm. I, I find it your core value, your core value. You talked about using those as measurements for yourselves, if you will. Yeah. How do you apply that to your clients? helping them discover their core value. Sure. How do they react to your core value versus to, you know, honesty and tell you, sure. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. How do you, how do you integrate that in their 
in your process of helping them discover who they are? Sure, yeah. Well, it can be really eye-opening for a lot of people. They're like, most people, it's it's just some, it's just an exercise they had to get through to move on to the next thing, right? Yeah. Like, they don't take it too serious. Yeah, right. Um, and so we show them some of the, the the ranking systems and the evaluation that we have for ours, and it starts to make a lot of sense. You know, right now, more than anything, when we meet with clients, one of their biggest wants, needs, desires is recruiting. Imagine that, right? I'm sure you've all heard that. Um, and so what we talk about is, is creating a culture that retains the t li that like-minded talent. Um, so the value system right now is is more important than ever because recruiting is so hard to do. Making sure that that you it's setting expectations so that when someone starts and and is thinking about working at your organization that they know what to expect from that. What's that culture going to be like? What are the people going to be like? And if this is if the if the values are true and you're you're living those things, then it's easy to set those expectations. You know, so I think. Um, that's part of it. Part of showing them how we use it plays into that a lot. Uh, and it's like this aha, eureka moment. They're like, yeah, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have skipped past that so fast. Or maybe we should invest it a little more time thinking about, you know, how important this is, you know? The mission and the vision are important as well. But if you, if you ask me one thing as, as starting an organization, the most important thing is going to be the core values. Yeah. Um, has that helped you in recruiting? Absolutely. I mean, you know, John knew us when we were Pickering Creative Group, um, and and Gary Pickering had started this business a long time ago. And when we started to think about rebranding, we absolutely just kind of wiped away the old core values and started all new. Um, and that was just a modern mindset we were looking for. I think part of one of the reasons why we decided to rebrand is that it felt a little bit, for lack of a better word, tired, you know? Um, that it was named after one person. This was a team, um, and uh, and a lot of people moving in the same direction, and uh, being able to kind of hone in on what what parts of our team were were helping us move forward is what helped us kind of create those values, and also like what made days longer. You know, what do we definitely don't want in our office, you know? And that's kind of where the positive uh, factor came in. Uh, I've been reading a little bit a lot uh, more recently about this idea of like toxic positivity, which I think is interesting too. And I think we're, we're looking for authentic positivity and, and helpfulness across the board when we talk about our, our positivity. We don't want everyone walking around with fake smiles on all the time. I mean, um, you know, Mental health is a is a big topic right now too. We're coming off of a pandemic, and people have dealt with a lot of things, and are trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. We want to we want to make positive change in people's business. We want to be positive, a positive space for people's lives, you know, and and we want to do whatever we can to help each other, you know, get to those spaces. And if you're sitting around complaining all day and, and not coming up with any solutions, um, that's not gonna help anybody. It's just kind of a, that can be toxic as well. So we don't, we're not asking anybody to be fake about, you know, wear a smile, let us know if there's a problem and, and we'll, we'll do what we can to help. But, uh, you know, we've, we've had people on our team in the past that were not, not, helpful in their attitudes and things like that and we just decided like maybe this is not the right place for them you know so and maybe you know and those are hard decisions to make but maybe there's a reason why they're not happy yeah you know um it's sometimes it's just not a great fit you're right it's not an easy decision to make especially if they're really good at their job yes. otherwise which they i mean some of those people happen but you know, it's just they're not aligning with everyone else and the kind of environment. I mean, there's nothing worse than going to a job where you don't get along with the people or the, you know, you're not, you're not gelling or have synergy with the people, you know, that you're with. And so I've been at those places and some of the other people that I worked with have been at those places. And if you're dreading going to work every day because of the people that are there, then you're not on a good, you're not in a good place. Life's too short. Absolutely. The pandemic has taught us anything. That. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, we have Jim Yankic on the screen. He's got Morning, Jim. It looks like he's muted. Oh, okay. Um, also with oh, that. Hi, everyone. Hi, John. <laughs> Great discussion today. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
and his permission to screw up book, she also was a, initially was a big advocate of the, she called it a different thing, but I'm gonna call it a compliment sandwich, okay. where you compliment somebody, then you tell them what they did wrong, and then you give them a bigger compliment. Yep. And then they don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. Right, because they, they don't remember what they did wrong because yeah. you sandwiched it between this. Framed it, yeah. Um, and then it, was, it just talked about progressing through and finding a way to just be authentic with people. Mm -hmm. And um, not everybody is going to be a good fit, and you um, have to find um, the right way to make that work. Sure, and there's learning experiences that come. No one's perfect. We expect failures. You know, everyone, you know, but there's something to be said about uh, that sting that you feel when you get that criticism, right? It makes it memorable. It makes a lasting impression. And then you, and then also from, from a leadership perspective, you can tell whether or not it matters to that person, if yep. they care, right? Um, and so that makes a big difference, too. Absolutely. And that then has a, on your customers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All, yep. Starts, yep. all starts with you. Yeah. Yeah, I've made mistakes um, back in the day. I, made, I make them all the time, actually. Um, but that's what helps you remember. I mean, those are the things that <laughs> really steer into your brain that steer you the right way the next time. So. Any other questions for Trent today? Yeah. Great. Um, so, do you have any travel plans coming up? Any big travel plans? Actually, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to um, San Diego. I'm going to be on Coronado Island for a while. Um, I've got a leadership group I'm meeting with there, and then I'm um, going to spend some time with my wife just on a little mini vacay and hopefully ride around the island on bikes and enjoy a little pre warm weather, you know, situation. It's nice to be able to break up the Nebraska winter with a little warm weather when you can. So, um, yeah, sneak that in there. That sounds like a great trip. Yeah, it's really nice. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, we will be back here again next week. And please help yourself to some more coffee. And let's give a round of applause for Trent. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. There's a little box of stuff. I got a few brochures, business cards, some koozies, pens, and stuff. Grab whatever you like out of there. Help yourself. And um, um, oh, Rados. Uh, her name is Katie Hofarson, and I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Motor Tango.